Welcome once again to Three Weeks of Weird. Today's story is The People of the Pit by Abraham Merritt. This weird tale first appeared in All Story Weekly in January of 1918, and thanks to Zontar Z for the request. The People of the Pit by Abraham Merritt North of us, a shaft of light shot halfway to the zenith. It came from behind the five peaks. The beam drove up through a column of blue haze, whose edges were marked as sharply as the rain that streams from the edges of a thundercloud. It was like the flash of a searchlight through an azure mist. It cast no shadows. As it struck upward, the summits were outlined hard and black, and I saw that the whole mountain was shaped like a hand. As the light silhouetted it, the gigantic fingers stretched. The hand seemed to thrust itself forward. It was exactly as though it moved to push something back. The shining beam held steady for a moment, then broke into myriads of little luminous globes that swung to and fro and dropped gently. They seemed to be searching. The forest had become very still. Every wood noise held its breath. I felt the dogs pressing against my legs. They too were silent but every muscle in their bodies trembled. Their hair was stiff along their backs, and their eyes, fixed on the falling lights, were filmed with the terror glaze. I looked at Anderson. He was staring at the north, where once more the beam had pulsed upward. It can't be the aurora. I spoke without moving my lips. My mouth was as dry as though Lao Cha had poured his fear dust down my throat. If it is, I never saw one like it, he answered in the same tone. Besides, who ever heard of an aurora at this time of the year? He voiced the thought that was in my own mind. It makes me think something is being hunted up there, he said. An unholy sort of hunt. It's well for us to be out of range. The mountain seems to move each time the shaft shoots up, I said. What's it keeping back, Star? It makes me think of the frozen hand of cloud that Shah Nador set before the gate of ghouls to keep them in the lairs that Eblis cut for them. He raised a hand, listening. From the north, and high overhead, there came a whispering. It was not the rustling of the aurora, that rushing, crackling sound like the ghosts of winds that blew at creation racing through the skeleton leaves of ancient trees that sheltered Lilith. It was a whispering that held in it a demand. It was eager. It called us to come where the beam was flashing. It drew. There was in it a note of inexorable insistence. It touched my heart with a thousand tiny fear-tipped fingers, and it filled me with a vast longing to race on and merge myself in the light. It must have been so that Ulysses felt when he strained at the mast and strove to obey the crystal-sweet singing of the sirens. The whispering grew louder. "'What the hell's the matter with those dogs?' cried Anderson savagely. "'Look at them!' The Malamutes, whining, were racing away toward the light we saw them disappear among the trees. There came back to us a mournful howling. Then that too died away, and left nothing but the insistent murmuring overhead. The glade we had camped in looked straight to the north. We had reached, I suppose, three hundred mile above the first great bend of the Cuscoquim, toward the Yukon. Certainly, we were in an untrodden part of the wilderness. We had pushed through from Dawson at the breaking of the spring on a fair lead to the lost five peaks between which, so the Athabascan medicine man had told us, the gold streams out like putty from a clenched fist. Not an Indian were we able to get to go with us. The land of the Hand Mountain was accursed, they said. We had sighted the peaks the night before, their tops faintly outlined against a pulsing glow, and now we saw the light that had led us to them. Anderson stiffened, through the whispering, had broken a curious pad-pad, and a rustling. It sounded as though a small bear were moving towards us. I threw a pile of wood on the fire and, as it blazed up, saw something break through the bushes. It walked on all fours, but it did not walk like a bear. All at once it flashed upon me. It was like a baby crawling upstairs. The forepaws lifted themselves in grotesquely infantile fashion. It was grotesque, but it was terrible. It grew closer. 
We reached for our guns and dropped them. Suddenly we knew that this crawling thing was a man. It was a man. Still, with the high climbing pad pad, he swayed to the fire. He stopped. Safe, whispered the crawling man in a voice that was an echo of the murmur overhead. Quite safe here. They can't get out of the blue, you know. They can't get you, unless you go to them. He fell over on his side. We ran to him. Anderson knelt. God's love, he said. Frank, look at this. He pointed to the hands. The wrists were covered with torn rags of a heavy shirt. The hands themselves were stumps. The fingers had been bent into the palms, and the flesh had been worn to the bone. They looked like the feet of a little black elephant. My eyes traveled down the body. Around the waist was a heavy band of yellow metal. From it fell a ring and a dozen links of shining white chain. What is he? Where did he come from? said Anderson. Look, he's fast asleep, yet even in his sleep his arms try to climb and his feet draw themselves up one after the other, and his knees. How in God's name was he ever able to move on them? It was even as he said, in the deep sleep that had come upon the crawler, arms and legs kept raising in a deliberate, dreadful climbing motion. It was as though they had a life of their own. They kept their movement independently of the motionless body. They were semaphoric motions. If you have ever stood at the back of a train, and had watched the semaphores rise and fall, you will know exactly what I mean. Abruptly, the overhead whispering ceased. The shaft of light dropped, and did not rise again. The crawling man became still. A gentle glow began to grow around us. It was dawn, and the short Alaskan summer night was over. Anderson rubbed his eyes, and turned to me a haggard face. Man! he exclaimed. You look as though you've been through a spell of sickness. No more than you, Star, I said. What do you make of it all? I'm thinking our only answer lies there, he answered, pointing to the figure that lay so motionless under the blankets we had thrown over him. Whatever it was, that's what it was after. There was no aurora about that light, Frank. It was like the flaring up of some queer hell the preacher folk never frightened us with. We'll go no further today, I said. I wouldn't wake him for all the gold that runs between the fingers of the five peaks, nor for all the devils that may be behind them. The crawling man lay in a sleep as deep as the sticks. We bathed and bandaged the pads that had been his hands. Arms and legs were as rigid as though they were crutches. He did not move while we worked over him. He lay as he had fallen, the arms a trifle raised, the knees bent. Why did he crawl? whispered Anderson. Why didn't he walk? I was filing the band about the waist. It was gold, but it was like no gold I had ever handled. Pure gold is soft. This was soft, but it had an unclean, viscid life of its own. It clung to the file. I gashed through it, bent it away from the body, and hurled it far off. It was loathsome. All that day he slept. Darkness came, and still he slept. That night there was no shaft of light, no questing globe, no whispering. Some spell of horror seemed lifted from the land. It was noon when the crawling man awoke. I jumped as the pleasant, drawling voice sounded. How long have I slept? He asked. His pale blue eyes grew quizzical as I stared at him. A night and uh, almost two days, I said. Was there any light up there last night? He nodded to the north eagerly. Any whispering? Neither, I answered. His head fell back, and he stared up at the sky. They've given it up, then? He said at last. Who have given it up? asked Anderson. Why, the people of the pit, replied the crawling man quietly. We stared at him. The people of the pit, he said. Things that the devil made before the flood, and that somehow have escaped God's vengeance. You weren't in any danger from them, unless you had followed their call. They can't get any further than the blue haze. I was their prisoner, he added simply. They were trying to whisper me back to them. Anderson and I looked at each other, the same thought in both our minds. You're wrong, said the crawling man. I'm not insane. Give me a very little to drink. I'm going to die soon, but I want you to take me as far south as you can before I die, and afterwards I want you to build a big fire and burn me. 
I want to be in such shape that no infernal spell of theirs can drag my body back to them. You'll do it too, when I've told you about them. He hesitated. I think their chain is off me, he said. I cut it off, I answered shortly. Thank God for that too, whispered the crawling man. He drank the brandy and water we lifted to his lips. Arms and legs quite dead, he said. Dead as I'll be soon. Well, they did well for me. Now, I'll tell you what's up there behind that hand. Hell! Now listen, my name is Stanton, Sinclair Stanton, class 1900, Yale, Explorer. I started away from Dawson last year to hunt for five peaks that rise like a hand in a haunted country and run pure gold between them. Same thing you were after? I thought so. Late last fall, my comrade sickened, sent him back with some Indians. Little later, all my Indians ran away from me. I decided I'd stick, built a cabin, stocked myself with food and lay down to winter it. In the spring, I started off again. Little less than two weeks ago, I sighted the five peaks. Not from this side, though. The other. Give me some more brandy. I'd made too wide a detour, he went on. I'd gotten too far north. I beat back. From this side. You see nothing but forest straight up to the base of the Anne Mountain. Over on the other side. He was silent for a moment. Over there is forest too. But it doesn't reach so far. No. I came out of it. Stretching miles in front of me was a level plain. It was as worn and ancient looking as the desert around the ruins of Babylon. At its end rose the peaks. Between me and them, far off, was what looked like a low dike of rocks. Then... I ran across the road. The road? cried Anderson incredulously. The road, said the crawling man. A fine smooth stone road. It ran straight on to the mountain. Oh, it was road all right, worn as though millions and millions of feet had passed over it for thousands of years. On each side of it was sand and heaps of stones. After a while I began to notice these stones. They were cut and the shape of the heap somehow gave me the idea that a hundred thousand years ago they might have been houses. I sensed man about them, and at the same time they smelled of immemorial antiquity. Well, the peaks grew closer, the heaps of ruins thicker. Something inexpressibly desolate hovered over them. Something reached from them that struck my heart like the touch of ghosts so old that they could be only the ghosts of ghosts. I went on. And now I saw that what I had thought to be the low rock range at the base of the peaks was a thicker litter of ruins. The hand mountain was really much farther off. The road passed between two high rocks that raised themselves like a gateway. The crawling man paused. They were a gateway, he said. I reached them. I went between them. And then I sprawled and clutched the earth in sheer awe. I was on a broad stone platform. Before me was sheer space. Imagine the Grand Canyon five times as wide, and with the bottom dropped out. That is what I was looking into. It was like peeping over the edge of a cleft world, down into the infinity where the planets roll. On the far side stood the five peaks. They looked like a gigantic warning hand stretched up to the sky. The lip of the abyss curved away on each side of me. I could see down perhaps a thousand feet. Then a thick blue haze shut out the eye. It was like the blue you see gather on the high hills at dusk, and the pit. It was awesome, awesome as the Maori Gulf of Ranelac, that sinks between the living and the dead, and that only the freshly released soul has strength to leap, but never strength to cross again. I crept back from the verge and stood up, weak. My hand rested against one of the pillars of the gateway. There was carving upon it. It bore in still sharp outlines the heroic figure of a man. His back was turned. His arms were outstretched. There was an odd peaked headdress upon him. I looked at the opposite pillar. It bore a figure exactly similar. The pillars were triangular, and the carvings were on the side away from the pit. The figures seemed to be holding something back. I looked closer. Behind the outstretched hands, I seemed to see other shapes. I traced them out vaguely. Suddenly I felt unaccountably sick. There had come to me an impression of enormous upright slugs. Their swollen bodies were faintly cut, all except the heads which were well-marked globes. They were unutterably loathsome. I turned from the gates back to the void. I stretched myself upon the slab. 
and looked over the edge. A stairway led down into the pit. A stairway? We cried. A stairway, repeated the crawling man as patiently as before. It seemed not so much carved out of the rock as built into it. The slabs were about six feet long and three feet wide. It ran down from the platform and vanished into the blue haze. But who could build such a stairway as that? I said. A stairway built into the wall of a precipice and leading down into a bottomless pit. Not bottomless, said the crawling man quietly. There was a bottom. I reached it. Reached it? We repeated. Yes, by the stairway, answered the crawling man. You see, I went down it. Yes, he said. I went down the stairway, but not that day. I made my camp back of the gates. At dawn I filled my knapsack with food, my two canteens with water from a spring that wells up there by the gateway, walked between the carved monoliths and stepped over the edge of the pit. The steps ran along the side of the rock at a forty-degree pitch as I went down and down. I studied them. They were of a greenish rock, quite different from the granitic porphyry that formed the wall of the precipice. At first, I thought that the builders had taken advantage of an outcropping stratum and had carved from it their gigantic flight. But the regularity of the angle at which it fell made me doubtful of this theory. After I had gone perhaps half a mile, I stepped out upon a landing. From this landing, the stairs made a V-shaped turn and ran on downward, clinging to the cliff at the same angle as the first flight. It was a zigzag, and after I had made three of these turns, I knew that the steps dropped straight down in a succession of such angles. No strata could be so regular as that. No, the stairway was built by hands. But whose? The answer is in those ruins around the edge, I think. Never to be read. By noon I had lost sight of the five peaks and the lip of the abyss. Above me, below me, was nothing but the blue haze. Beside me, too, was nothingness, for the further breast of rock had long since vanished. I felt no dizziness, and any trace of fear was swallowed in a vast curiosity. What was I to discover? Some ancient and wonderful civilization that had ruled when the poles were tropical gardens? Nothing living, I felt sure, or was too old for life. Still, a stairway so wonderful must lead to something quite as wonderful, I knew. What was it? I went on. At regular intervals I had passed the mouths of small caves. There would be two thousand steps, and then an opening, two thousand more steps, and an opening, and so on and on. Late that afternoon, I stopped before one of these clefts. I suppose they had gone then three miles down the pit, although the angles were such that I had walked in all fully ten miles. I examined the entrance. On each side were carved the figures of the great portal above, only now they were standing face forward the arms outstretched as though to hold something back from the outer depths. The faces were covered with veils. There were no hideous shapes behind them. I went inside. The fissure ran back for twenty yards like a burrow. It was dry and perfectly light. Outside, I could see the blue haze rising upward like a column, its edges clearly marked. I felt an extraordinary sense of security, although I had not been conscious of any fear. I felt that the figures at the entrance were guardians, but against what? The blue haze thickened and grew faintly luminescent. I fancied that it was dusk above. I ate and drank a little and slept. When I awoke, the blue had lightened again, and I fancied it was dawn above. I went on. I forgot the gulf yawning at my side. I felt no fatigue and little hunger or thirst, although I had drunk and eaten spurringly. That night I spent within another of the caves, and at dawn I descended again. It was late that day when I first saw the city. He was silent for a time. The city, he said at last. There is a city, you know, but not such a city as you have ever seen, nor any other man who has lived to tell of it. The pit, I think, is shaped like a bottle. The opening before the five peaks is the neck, but how wide the bottom is, I do not know. Thousands of miles, maybe. I had begun to catch little glints of light far down in the blue. Then I saw the tops of trees, I suppose they are. But not our kind of trees. Unpleasant, snaky kind of trees. They reared themselves on high thin trunks, and 
Their tops were nests of thick tendrils with ugly little leaves like arrowheads. The trees were red, a vivid, angry red. Here and there, I glimpsed spots of shining yellow. I knew these were water, because I could see things breaking through their surface, or at least I could see the splash and ripple, but what it was that disturbed them I never saw. Straight beneath me was the city. I looked down upon mile after mile of closely packed cylinders. They lay upon their sides in pyramids of three, of five, of dozens, piled upon each other. It is hard to make you see what that city is like. Look, suppose you have water pipes of a certain length, and first you lay three of them side by side, and on top of them you place two, and on these two one. Or suppose you take five for a foundation, and place on these four, and then three, then two, and then one. You see? That was the way they looked. But they were topped by towers, by minarets, by flurs, by fans, and twisted monstrosities. They gleamed as though coated with pale rose flame. Beside them, the venomous red trees raised themselves like the heads of hydras, guarding nests of gigantic, jeweled, and sleeping worms. A few feet beneath me, the stairway jutted out into a titanic arch, unearthly as the span that bridges hell and leads to Asgard. It curved out and down straight through the top of the highest pile of carven cylinders, and then it vanished through it. It was appalling. It was demonic. The crawling man stopped. His eyes rolled up into his head. He trembled, and his arms and legs began their horrible crawling movement. From his lips came a whispering. It was an echo of the high murmuring we had heard the night he came to us. I put my hands over his eyes. He quieted. The things are cursed, he said. The people of the pit, did I whisper. Yes, but they can't get me now. They can't. After a time, he began as quietly as before. I crossed the span. I went down through the top of that building. Blue darkness shrouded me for a moment, and I felt the steps twist into a spiral. I wound down, and then I was standing high up in... Uh, I can't tell you in what. I'll have to call it a room. We have no images for what is in the pit. A hundred feet below me was the floor. The walls sloped down and out from where I stood in a series of widening crescents. The place was colossal, and it was filled with a curious mottled red light. It was like the light inside a green and gold flecked fire opal. I went down to the last step. Far in front of me rose a high, columned altar. Its pillars were carved in monstrous scrolls, like mad octopuses with a thousand drunken tentacles. They rested on the backs of shapeless monstrosities carved in crimson stone. The altar front was a gigantic slab of purple, covered with carvings. I can't describe these carvings. No human being could. The human eye cannot grasp them any more than it can grasp the shapes that haunt the fourth dimension. Only a subtle sense in the back of the brain sensed them vaguely. They were formless things that gave no conscious image, yet pressed into the mind like small hot seals, ideas of hate, of combats between unthinkable monstrous things, victories in a nebulous hell of steaming, obscene jungles, aspirations and ideals immeasurably loathsome. And as I stood, I grew aware of something that lay behind the lip of the altar, fifty feet above me. I knew it was there. I felt it with every hair and every tiny bit of my skin. Something infinitely malignant, infinitely horrible, infinitely ancient. It lurked. It brooded. It threatened, and it was invisible. Behind me was a circle of blue light. I ran for it. Something urged me to turn back, to climb the stairs and make a way. It was impossible. Repulsion for that unseen thing raced me onward as though a current had my feet. I passed through the circle. I was out on a street that stretched on into dim distance between rows of the carven cylinders. Here and there the red trees arose. Between them rolled the stone burrows, and now I could take in the amazing ornamentation that clothed them. They were like the trunks of smooth-skinned trees that had fallen and had been clothed with eye-reaching noxious orchids. Yes, those cylinders were like that and more. They should have gone out with the dinosaurs. They were monstrous. They struck the eyes like a blow, and they passed across the nerves like a rasp, and nowhere was the sight or sound of living thing. 
There were circular openings in the cylinders, like the circle in the temple of the stairway. I passed through one of them. I was in a long, bare-vaulted room whose curving sides half closed twenty feet over my head, leaving a wide slit that opened into another vaulted chamber above. There was absolutely nothing in the room, save the same mottled reddish light that I had seen in the temple. I stumbled. I still could see nothing, but there was something on the floor over which I had tripped. I reached down, and my hand touched a thing cold and smooth that moved under it. I turned and ran out of that place. I was filled with a loathing that had in it something of madness. I ran on and on blindly, wringing my hands, weeping with horror. When I came to myself, I was still among the stone cylinders and red trees. I tried to retrace my steps, to find the temple. I was more than afraid. I was like a new loose soul, panic-stricken with the first terrors of hell. I could not find the temple. Then the haze began to thicken and glow, the cylinders to shine more brightly. I knew that it was dusk in the world above, and I felt that with dusk my time of peril had come, that the thickening of the haze was the signal for the awakening of whatever things lived in this pit. I scrambled up the sides of one of the burrows, I hid behind a twisted nightmare of stone. Perhaps, I thought, there was a chance of remaining hidden until the blue lightened and the peril passed. There began to grow around me a murmur. It was everywhere, and it grew and grew into a great whispering. I peeped from the side of the stone down into the street. I saw lights passing and repassing. More and more lights. They swam out of the circular doorways and they thronged the street. The highest were eight feet above the pave, the lowest perhaps two. They hurried, they sauntered, they bowed, they stopped and whispered, and there was nothing under them. Nothing under them, breathed Anderson. No, he went on. That was the terrible part of it. There was nothing under them, yet certainly the lights were living things. They had consciousness, volition, thought. What else I did not know. They were nearly two feet across the largest. The centre was a bright nucleus, red, blue, green. This nucleus faded off gradually into a misty glow that did not end abruptly. It too seemed to fade off into nothingness, but a nothingness that had under it a somethingness. I strained my eyes trying to grasp this body into which the lights merged and which one could only feel was there, but could not see. And all at once I grew rigid something cold and thin like a whip that touched my face. I turned my head. Close behind were three of the lights. They were a pale blue. They looked at me, if you can imagine lights that are eyes. Another whiplash gripped my shoulder. Under the closest light came a shrill whispering. I shrieked. Abruptly, the murmuring in the street ceased. I dragged my eyes from the pale blue globe that held them and looked out. The lights in the streets were rising by myriads to the level of where I stood. There they stopped and peered at me. They crowded and jostled as though they were a crowd of curious people on Broadway. I felt a score of the lashes touch me. When I came to myself, I was again in the great place of the stairway, lying at the foot of the altar. All was silent. There were no lights, only the mottled red glow. I jumped to my feet and ran toward the steps. Something jerked me back to my knees. Then I saw that around my waist had been fastened a yellow ring of metal. From it hung a chain, and this chain passed up over the lip of the high ledge. I was chained to the altar. I reached into my pockets for my knife to cut through the ring. It was not there. I had been stripped of everything, except one of the canteens that I had hung around my neck, which I suppose they had thought was part of me. I tried to break the ring. It seemed alive. It writhed in my hands and it drew itself closer around me. I pulled at the chain. It was immovable. There came to me the consciousness of the unseen thing above the altar. I groveled at the foot of the slab and wept. Think, alone in that place of strange light with the brooding ancient horror above me, a monstrous thing, a thing unthinkable, an unseen thing that poured forth horror. After a while, I gripped myself. Then, I saw beside one of the pillars a yellow bowl filled with a thick white liquid. I drank it. If it killed, I did not care, but its taste was pleasant, and as I drank, my strength came back to me with a rush. Clearly, I was not to be starved. The lights, 
whatever they were, had a conception of human needs. And now, the reddish mottled gleam began to deepen. Outside arose the humming, and through the circle that was the entrance came streaming the globes. They ranged themselves in ranks until they filled the temple. Their whispering grew into a chant, a cadenced whispering chant that rose and fell, rose and fell, while to its rhythm the globes lifted and sank, lifted and sank. All that night the lights came and went, and all that night the chant sounded as they rose and fell. At the last, I felt myself only an atom of consciousness in a sea of cadenced whispering, an atom that rose and fell with the bowing globes. I tell you that even my heart pulsed in unison with them. The red glow faded, the light streamed out, the whispering died. I was again alone, and I knew that once again day had broken in my own world. I slept. When I awoke, I found beside the pillar more of the white liquid. I scrutinized the chain that held me to the altar. I began to rub two of the links together. I did this for hours. When the red began to thicken, there was a ridge worn in the links. Hope rushed up within me. There was, then, a chance to escape. With the thickening, the lights came again. All through that night, the whispering chants sounded, and the globes rose and fell. The chant seized me. It pulsed through me until every nerve and muscle quivered to it. My lips began to quiver. They strove like a man trying to cry out on a nightmare. And at last they, too, were whispering the chant of the people of the pit. My body bowed in unison with the lights. I was, in movement and sound, one with the nameless things, while my soul sank back sick with horror and powerless. While I whispered, I saw them. Saw the lights? I asked stupidly. Saw the things under the lights? He answered. Great, transparent, snail-like bodies, dozens of waving tentacles stretching from them, round gaping mouths under the luminous seeing globes. They were like the ghosts of inconceivably monstrous slugs. I could see through them. And as I stirred, still bowing and whispering, the dawn came, and they streamed to and through the entrance. They did not crawl or walk. They floated. They floated and were gone. I did not sleep. I worked all that day at my chain. By the thickening of the red, I had worn it a six through. And all that night I whispered and bowed with the pit people, joining in their chant to the thing that brooded above me. Twice again the red thickened and the chant held me. Then on the morning of the fifth day, I broke through the worn links of the chain. I was free. I drank from the bowl of white liquid and poured what was left in my flask. I ran to the stairway. I rushed up and past that unseen horror behind the altar ledge and was out upon the bridge. I raced across the span and up the stairway. Can you think what it is to climb straight up the verge of a cleft world with hell behind you? Hell was behind me, and terror rolled me. The city had long been lost in the blue haze before I knew that I could climb no more. My heart beat upon my ears like a sledge. I fell before one of the little caves, feeling that here at last was sanctuary. I crept far back within it and waited for the haze to thicken. Almost at once it did so, from far below me came a vast and angry murmur. At the mouth of the rift, I saw a light pulse up through the blue, die down, and as it dimmed, I saw myriads of the globes that are the eyes of the pit people swing downward into the abyss. Again and again the light pulsed and the globes fell. They were hunting me. The whispering grew louder, more insistent. There grew in me the dreadful desire to join in the whispering, as I had done in the temple. I bit my lips through and through to still them. All that night the beam shot up through the abyss, the globe swung and the whispering sounded, and now I knew the purpose of the caves, and of the sculptured figures that still had power to guard them. But what were the people who had carved them? Why had they built their city around the verge, and why had they set that stairway in the pit? What had they been to those things that dwelt at the bottom, and what use had the things been to them that they should live beside their dwelling place? But there had been some purpose, was certain. No work so prodigious as the stairway would have been undertaken otherwise. But what was the purpose? And why was it that those who had dwelt about the abyss had passed away, ages gone, and the dwellers in the abyss still lived? I could find no answer. Nor can I find any now. 
I have not the shred of a theory. Dawn came as I wondered, and with it, silence. I drank what was left of the liquid in my canteen, crept from the cave, and began to climb again. That afternoon, my legs gave out. I tore off my shirt, made from it pads for my knees and coverings for my hands. I crawled upward, I crawled up and up, and again I crept into one of the caves and waited until again the blue thickened. The shaft of light shot through it, and the whispering came. But now there was a new note in the whispering. It was no longer threatening. It called and coaxed. It drew. A new terror gripped me. There had come upon me a mighty desire to leave the cave and go out where the light swung, to let them do with me as they pleased, carry me where they wished. The desire grew. It gained fresh impulse with every rise of the beam, until at last I vibrated with the desire, as I had vibrated to the chant in the temple. My body was a pendulum. Up would go the beam, and I would swing toward it. Only my soul kept steady. It held me fast to the floor of the cave, and all that night it fought with my body against the spell of the pit people. Dawn came. Again I crept from the cave and faced the stairway. I could not rise. My hands were torn and bleeding, my knees in agony. I forced myself upward step by step. After a while my hands became numb. The pain left my knees. They deadened, step by step. My will drove my body upward upon them. And then... A nightmare of crawling up infinite stretches of steps, memories of dull horror while hidden within caves with the lights pulsing without and whisperings that called and called me, memory of a time when I awoke to find that my body was obeying the call and had carried me halfway out between the guardians of the portals while thousands of gleaming globes rested in the blue haze and watched me. Glimpses of bitter fights against sleep and always, always, to climb up and up along infinite distances of steps that led from Abaddon to a paradise of blue sky and open world. At last, a consciousness of the clear sky close above me, the lip of the pit before me, memory of passing between the great portals of the pit and of steady withdrawal from it, dreams of giant men with strange peaked crowns and veiled faces who pushed me onward and onward, and held back Roman candle globules of light that sought to draw me back to a gulf wherein planets swam between the branches of red trees that had snakes for crowns. And then a long, long sleep. How long? God alone knows. In a cleft of rocks, an awakening to see far in the north, the beam still rising and falling, the light still hunting, the whispering high above me, calling again crawling on dead arms and legs that moved, that moved like the ancient mariner's ship, without volition of mine, but that carried me from a haunted place. And then, your fire, and this safety. The crawling man smiled at us for a moment, then swiftly life faded from his face. He slept. That afternoon, we struck camp, and carrying the crawling man, started back south, for three days we carried him, and still he slept, and on the third day, still sleeping, he died. We built a great pile of wood, and we burned his body as he had asked. We scattered his ashes about the forest with the ashes of the trees that had consumed him. It must be a great magic indeed that could disentangle those ashes and draw him back in a rushing cloud to the pit he called a cursed. I do not think that even the people of the pit have such a spell. No. But we did not return to the Five Peaks to see. Thank you for listening today. Have you enjoyed this reading? and would like to support our work here at Horror Babble, please feel free to pay us a visit over at Patreon. Links to Patreon and the Bandcamp shop can be found in the video description below. Until next time, goodbye.